Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everybody to my fourth Tuesday Revolutionize Your Retirement interview with Expert Series to help you create a fulfilling second half of life. I'm Dory Mincer, your host and owner of Revolutionize Retirement. So I am delighted you all are here, and I want to introduce you now to our wonderful guest, Catherine Britton. And I was actually introduced to her from Don Officer, who's in Ottawa, Canada. And I want to do a shout out to thank Don for the introduction. Don's been part of what I what is often now still referred to as the Boomers and Beyond Special Interest Group, which actually started in 2007. So anyway, thanks, Don, for introducing me to Catherine. I think if you're going to find this really helpful today, whether you're thinking about writing about yourself and your own stories, memoir writing, or if there's still some words of wisdom and books that you want to write. So I'm delighted that you're all here. So Catherine Britton actually didn't start out intending to focus on writing. In her 30-year career as a software energer, engineer, sorry, it was a surprise to find herself writing more prose than code, producing design documents, patent applications, and papers. In 2006, Catherine earned a Master of Applied Positive Psychology, a master's degree in the pioneer class for the program at the University of Pennsylvania. That's under the auspice of uh, Martin Seligman, who many of you know about, have read, heard about. Um, Searching for a new career that would contribute to worldwide well-being, that led her to working with writers. And in 2013, she ran her first writer's workshop, Since then, more than 140 people have gathered in regular workshop meetings. More than 3,700 writing submissions have gone through this process. She also coaches individual authors and has edited several other books. Some of her clients call her the midwife of words. I love that phrase, the midwife of words. Catherine continues to write with zest herself. She's published more than 100 articles online. Her books include Smarts and Stamina. The Busy Person's Guide to Op- Optimal Health and Performance, Character Strengths Matter, is a resident of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and she's, as she says, overjoyed to be the close-by grandmother of two preschool-age boys. Catherine, welcome, and I'm so delighted that, that you're here with us. And, I'm so happy know, to be Yeah, no, go ahead. I love <laughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm, I have to tell myself I need to really wait and make sure the other person has stopped talking. And so I guess I should have waited just a second longer for you. But I'm so <laughs> happy really. to be here <laughs> yeah. and have a chance to talk about people. Great. I'm glad that you're here, too. Catherine, why did you write Sit Right Chair? Can we start? I always like to start with that. I have been working with writers now for actually explicitly working with writers since 2013. And even before then, I was working with people. I I wrote a couple of books before 2013. And what I find is that people uh, many times want to write, but they run into lots of fears and blocks that get in their way. They also seem to start out feeling like they ought to be able to write something and have it just come out flowingly and be exactly right. So when they see what emerges, they get really discouraged. I looked at it and I thought, we don't necessarily learn in school that writing is a practice, that writing is an activity that gets better with practice and gets better with paying attention. And so we don't really learn how to pay attention or how to practice. So what I found was that there were certain things that that my clients were doing that helped them get better at writing, and I started collecting those ideas into one place. I did it from the point of view of experiments, because as far as I'm concerned, there's no – you can go out there and you can find various books that will tell you this is how you can become a writer. It might work for you and it might not. I don't think there's one recipe that works for absolutely everybody. So my thought is that you have certain things that you try. If they work for you, you do more of them. 
if they don't work for you, you don't beat yourself up and say, oh, I'm just not a writer. Instead, you say, mm, I need to try something else. I like that idea, the, the idea of both the practice, but what I'm hearing in that with the experiments is that it, it's like reveling in the idea that we can be a learner and we don't have to know everything you know, when we first start out or have it all clear cut in our mind. Um, so I like that idea of experiments. You use what works and toss what doesn't. But how do people get inspiration, you know, to to try to even think about writing. What happens in that way? How, how can inspiration be sparked? Well, I think we pay too much attention to this idea that in, inspiration is something that comes comes in big flashes and that it's transitory and then it's gone. I actually have two, two people who were, went through my writer's workshop who wrote a book called Dare to Inspire, it mm -hmm. talks about ways that we can actually learn to have sustainable inspiration. And their idea is there are certain practices that people can try out that will help them be able to pull inspiration to them rather than wait as if it's a flash that, that, that has to come from like a thunderbolt that has to come from on high. But the, I would also say, I know some people who really like to have the whole structure in their mind before they start writing. But I've also found some people who just, that what, what they find works is to write little pieces. Like they'll mm -hmm. sit down and they'll think, oh, today, I, I had this experience this week. It was really, it was a really cool experience. I really, I observed this about it. And then sit down and write that, write it up as just as one little, one little story. The one person I was working with recently who did this, found she'd had an experience with a client. She, when she went to sit down to write, she started writing the story and it just flowed right out of her. And she put it in a pile of, and realized that she could think about writing as stringing these little stories that she could collect one at a time. She could think about stringing them together later into a larger piece of work. Instead of thinking about having the whole piece in her mind at once, she could work on it as a collection of gathering beads and then stringing them together into a, a, a necklace. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. And I think it makes so much sense. When you think about it, just in terms of doing anything, it can be overwhelming unless you break it into little manageable parts. So I think this makes a lot of sense of stringing together a lot of separate writings or thoughts. I think that's really helpful. Tell us a little about this conference that you went to. And I think it was what it was a workshop on for the Canadian Positive Psychology Conference. And I think if I read correctly, you presented like seven experiments to liberate your voice and started with, you know, talking some about fear of writing. Can you share a little from that conference and to bookmark it with people of just thinking about what gets in the way? I think that uh, one of the things that you make, make come to my mind is that I should have given you the, the link to the handout for that. Since I didn't actually prepare a handout for today, that handout could actually mm -hmm. serve. But the idea, what I find is that actually what I would like to say to the audience is that everybody is afraid of writing. Mm -hmm. Probably even Stephen King is afraid of writing. Um, everybody's afraid of writing, but what you have to do is to accept the fear, realize that it's there, and that you share it with everybody, just like the fear that you have of public speaking. I've done a fair amount of public speaking, but every time I get up in front of a camera or get up in front as I am now, I still have butterflies in my stomach. I still have nervous about things, but I go ahead and do it anyway. So the idea is to take use the use various experiments to turn your attention away from the fear and towards the work and say, mm -hmm. accept the fact that the fear is going to be there, that it's going to be part of the background, but not to let it dominate what's going on. Part of what helps is to realize that absolutely everybody writes what uh, Anne Lamott calls shitty first draft. <laughs> so if you're aware that what comes out when you first start writing is a shitty first draft, then you can accept the fact that you're, it's just, it's just your starting point. 
and that the starting point can then evolve into something that's a lot more polished and a lot more ready for the rest of the world. Again, I think it's so excellent to hear that because it's like allowing yourself again to be a beginner, to be a learner, and it doesn't have to be all polished, and it's not going to be all polished at the beginning. I really hate the words that I often hear, which are the expression, I'm just not a writer. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I always want to say to people, yes, you are. You write grocery lists. You write emails. <laughs> you write all kinds of things already. So there's nothing that, that says that you can't really put a label on it and say, I am not a writer. If you choose to write, if you if writing is important to you, and it's not important to everybody, but if you choose to write, then what you can do is to think about your audience, think about what people might want to hear, might need to hear, and then start to start to take the attention away from yourself and thinking about yourself as, oh, I'm the writer, and am I any good at it? But instead, put your attention on who am I writing for, and then start thinking about well, what might they need. And that can help mm-hmm. with the fear as well. Mm-hmm. Um, That's very helpful. Who am I writing for and what do they need? Why did you call the book Sit, Write, Share? How did the title evolve? When I was working with one gentleman, it was actually continues to be in my writer's workshops and and continues actually facilitate some of my writer's workshops. And I used his name in the book, so I'll mention it now. I was working with him because he, as a writing coach, and he just wasn't getting anything done. And so I finally one day said to him, Brian, just sit, right. And he said, oh, that could be the title of your book. <laughs> so, and I, and for, for a while, I just, I wasn't thinking about writing a book. He's one of the people that encouraged me to do. But for a while, I thought of it as a working title. And later on, I'd come up with a real title. But then I workshopped the idea of the book. And, and I can talk about workshops in a minute if you like. But I workshopped the idea of the book. And the people in the group were really excited by it because they said that the sit actually brings to mind meditation. Because people often refer to meditation as a sitting. You just need to sit. You need to do the sitting part of the meditation. And I realized that a lot of what goes into getting ready to write is very similar to getting ready to meditate. And part of that is to be able to actually be there to do it. Another is to get rid of the, or to accept and deal with all of the little voices in your head that are going on and telling you what you can and can't do. And to deal with the, to deal with the fears, to deal with the, and to open up and allow your own ideas and your inspiration to come in. So it seemed to me to be a fairly appropriate word to use for the first part of the book, which is about getting yourself to actually do the work. You were talking about the the sitting down and sitting is similar to kind of mindfulness meditation. Um, Precisely. And then there's the right part, which is pretty obvious, but I did break it up in the book into three three separate activities. There's imagine, which is coming up with the ideas. There's the drafting, which is actually writing down the first draft. And then there's the editing, which is a really important part of writing, and people often look at it as if it's an unpleasant part, but it actually can be a very creative and an interesting part of writing. I sometimes think of writing as being a little bit like playing with clay, trying to form something mm-hmm. out of clay, particularly now that I can write on a computer so I can move things around easily. When I first started writing, I was writing with a typewriter, and it was a lot less easy then. But now that you're on a computer, you can take a paragraph and you can say, what if I put it over here, and so, like picking a piece of clay apart and moving it to a separate part of your of your structure that you're building? The editing part, I think, can be really important. And I think people, if I have found, I have learned to find it really fun. And then to move on to the last word in the title, share, People, I think one of the things that stops people from writing is that it feels like such a solitary experiment, experience. You sit down by yourself doing the right, and, and 
it's between you and a computer screen or you and chat GPT if you happen to be using that tool to get some of your writing out. So the idea that there are actually ways to be thinking not only about the people that you're trying to reach, which might just be your future self, by the way, uh, the people that you're trying to reach, but also thinking about people who can support you, people who might help you with a publication, your pathway to publication, and how do you actually get the word about your piece of work out there so other people know that they can buy it. Uh, or buy it or share it in one or form, share, whatever right. form you choose to, to, to share it. And is this where some of the workshops you do fit in? Maybe you, you had just said before, maybe you'd mentioned the workshop. Does Do you find that either people joining workshops or joining kind of writer groups or peer groups or something, does that help a lot to counter the loneliness? Absolutely. I think that whatever kind of writing group that you can choose, that you can pull together, the one thing I would say is, don't go looking for, there are some people who will say you need brutal feedback. So don't go looking for an environment where you get brutal feedback. I don't think anybody actually benefits from brutal feedback, no matter what the experts may say. What I found in terms of how to get feedback, and I, I, let me walk you through the way a writer's workshop works so that you get a sort of a sense of how this can, how to set up a, a group to perhaps to give each other feedback on writing. I invite people to send pieces. I have, let me start, formed writers workshops that are groups of four or groups of three. And that, I guess that's a detail that doesn't really matter. But they're small groups of people who get together regularly and share pieces of writing. And when they share the pieces of writing, we ask the author in the group to introduce the piece briefly without telling us what it's about because we're going to tell them but just to say this is a blog post this is a chapter in my book this is a letter that i'm writing to the editor this is an op-ed whatever the purpose of the piece is then they become a fly on the wall which means since we do these meetings on zoom they put themselves on mute and they turn their camera off usually so the idea is that they get to hear how other people are experiencing their work without being part of the conversation. This is really important because if you're part of the conversation, you're always thinking about how to answer the things that people are bringing up. And so the idea is that instead of trying to answer, that you're just taking it in. The, whatever people say, it's your piece of writing. You get to do with it whatever you want. There's no requirement that you take any of the converse, any of the feedback and use it. But we don't really want to have a debate with you about, about, about your piece. So we actually have three rounds. <laughs> Should I stop and give you a chance to talk for a minute before, before I proceed? Hmm. We'll give some, yeah. No, I think give some examples. That would really be helpful. All right, so we have three rounds. In the first round, everybody that's there, the, all of the people who've done the reviewing, and they've read it ahead of time, and so they've thought about what they want to say. So the first round is, what was this piece about, and how did it affect me? And mm -hmm. so that gives the person, the fly on the wall, a chance to see, okay, how did my piece land with this audience of people that, are, that have read it, this friendly audience of people that have read it? So they get to hear whether or not people actually picked up what they intended to, to get across in the piece. And that's why we don't really want them to tell us what it's about when they're introducing it, because we want them to hear the piece. If, when you write a piece and publish it, it goes by itself into the world. You don't get to go along with it and explain <laughs> it to everybody. So it has to stone. Okay. So then once we finish the first round, the second round, the, the big question is, what makes this piece of writing strong? Mm -hmm. I have found what works best is for me to ask each person to put up, to list one, their top strength. So I go mm -hmm. around and I call on people and they tell me their top strength. And then we open up the floor and have a general discussion about what else is strong about the piece. When that starts to fade down a little bit, 
I will say, are we ready to go on to the final round? And then the question is, what could make this piece of writing even stronger? Now, you'll notice a couple of things there. I'm not asking what's broken about the piece. I'm not asking what's bad about the piece. I'm asking what could make it stronger. And the comments that people make may vary at, they may be at the very high level, like, I felt like this person buried the lead. I didn't know till page three what this piece was about. Or it might be that very first paragraph could be repeated in some form at the end to, to tie it up really well. Or it could be, there needs to be a call to action. This is a blog post. There needs to be some kind of call to action at the end. So the, the, the suggestions that people make might be structural. They might, but they could also be, I, there's a sentence in the middle of paragraph three that I just don't get. I don't understand what it's saying. Or it could be the most important article in the whole piece is in the middle of a paragraph on page two. Could you somehow put it in a place that's more prominent? So you get feedback about how other people experience your work. And that, that can give you a sense of what you might need to do to change in order to make it even more effective. Those are excellent examples. And I'm even thinking as you say it that even if somebody's not part of a group, it, those could be the questions that are posed when people send it out to some early readers. But to have the specific kind of questions in mind that get the person reading it or listening to it thinking in a certain way, I, that, I think that's excellent. Um, so let's get to some of the experiments. I, I think your book contains, if I'm not mistaken, 55 experiments. I think, as I recall, there are about 13 in the sit part, there are 26 in the write part, and 15 in the share part. Can you know, tell us about, well, maybe we'll start with the sit part, a few examples of some of the experiments, and then maybe what your favorite one is? Some examples in the sit part have to do with, first of all, we mentioned before those voices in your head that, and I was remembering a story from working with a client who said that he always remembered Whenever he sat down to write, he'd have the voice of his 10th grade English teacher in the back of his mind. And so this always made him, and he could hear her sort of sniffing when he handed back his work and saying, you'll never be able to write. This is just such, I think the words that I used in the book were vacuity of thought wedded to illiteracy of expression, which is the, my, when I was in the, a senior in English, we were getting ready for the AP English exam. And our, my English teacher said that one, which is the lowest level of the grades that you can get for the AP English exam, that that's what a, that stood for vacuity of thought wedded to illiteracy of expression. And that was a long time ago. I still remember those words, so they really stuck with me. But getting back to the topic here, you're, you've got the voice of somebody telling you can't write or that your writing's crappy, or you may even be your own voice. So one question is, how do you get past, how do you deal with the fact that you have that voice going on in your head? And there are various things that you can try. I'm actually flipping to the, to the, you can, and by the way the book is set up, is it, each experiment starts out with a story. So similar to the story I just told you about the English teacher, Mrs. McGregor. Then there's some observations, often of which pull in some kind of reference to what's to the background. Where did I get this idea? Where did it come from? Is there research behind it? And then steps, various things that you can do. I'll just read you a couple of the steps from this section. When you find yourself feeling stuck, listen for the critical voice in your head. Can you identify it? Do any memories come to the surface? Notice them without judgment. So just facing the fact that you do have this voice, but knowing that you're not alone. You're not the only person that has this particular fear. My second one, I think actually I'm very fond of, reflect on the various skills that you use almost without thinking. Possible examples include riding a bicycle, sewing a seam, using a smartphone, and driving a car. Which one brings the clearest memories of starting something that you did not know how to do? Think about the specific actions that helped you gain expertise. Remember missteps 
as well as triumphs. Use that to help you work through your self-doubt and your writing resistance. So the idea is this writing is something nobody was born knowing how to write well. Everybody had to learn it. And so accepting the fact that you have to learn it and you've learned other things and drawing on your experience learning other things can help you actually get past the feelings that you have of, of that I'm just not any good at this. Excellent. Any other of the SIT experiments that you want to just mention? I think people, I actually think it's an excellent book, and I recommend people get the book. But any other in the SIT before we move on to the second set of experiments? I work a lot with people on procrastination. Mm -hmm. And so this one is something that I learned when I was in college. I used to call it my procrastination hierarchy, but when I was writing the book, I thought of it more as procrastination Aikido. Because the a lot of times people talk about motivation, and they're thinking about motivation as if it's a unitary thing, like I am motivated, I'm a motivated person or whatever. But it turns out, no, you actually have a lot of different things to do in your life, and you're motivated differently for all of them. So I find that if I can list the things that, I, that are on my to-do list and I can find something that I want to do even less than writing, then somehow thinking about that thing that I want to do even less than writing actually gets, gives me the energy to start writing. So I, the idea is to look at all of your different things and use, use the energy that comes from avoiding something else as an energy to actually do the writing. It's just something that's worked in my life. I don't know whether it's, but I found when I was in college that having to study for exams made it easier to write papers because I disliked studying for exams even more than I liked writing papers at that time. So I'd use the energy of not doing something else to get me actually help me do something. I really love that example. That's great. All right, let's just shift a little to the right part. You know, what I, I think you have 26 right experiment, um, experiments. Can you share some of them and then also tell us maybe what your favorite right experiment is? I actually break the writing part down into three groups. And one of the experiments is addresses that breaking it down. And it's the, the fact that people really need to separate the drafting part, that is coming up with your first draft, from the editing part. A lot of times people, so to separate these three steps, the, the three steps are imagine, draft, and edit. For the imagine part, I do a lot of writing in my mind when I'm walking around, when I'm doing dishes, when I'm picking up the house, when I'm doing things that don't take a lot of concentration, but I can play with ideas in my head. And so give yourself credit for the time that you take to think about the ideas that you want to get across, to remember stories, to collect stories. Give yourself credit. That's part of the writing process. Hmm. When it comes to the drafting, I suggest that you sit down and let yourself write and don't worry about what's coming out. Just write and let the words emerge. And don't go back and don't say, oh, that's not very said very well, or, oh, that shouldn't be the first sentence, or that, whatever. Just sit down and write without, you know, basically, don't use your delete key on your computer or your backup mm -hmm. key if you have a, mm -hmm. so write and let it emerge, and then later you can come back to it as bring your editor and say, okay, editor, here goes, and then the editor can start playing with it and moving things around and trying things in different order and making sentences shorter or doing all of the things it takes to make a really fine finished product out of it. So if you separate these three activities, if you don't try to do them all at the same time, you will have a, a lot better time with your writing. Great advice. Yeah, great advice. Uh, what other kind of write experiments? And again, what's your favorite? One that has come up many times in, in, over my writing time is the idea of collecting story seeds. So I think of a story seed as being something that happened that you could actually develop into a story to go in either in your, say your memoir, or it could go in if you're writing a, a book 
to, to demonstrate some kind of act, behavior change or whatever. The story could illustrate some aspect of it. So make a note of it somehow. Make a note in your, on your phone in the note section or make a, put it on a note card or, but collect the story seeds because they, the, and you don't have to say a lot, just enough words that you can bring the situation back to mind and then, and build out the story. When I was, when I was at a, I, I attended a, a software engineer, not a software engineer, sorry, positive psychology conference back in, I think, 2007. Albert Bandura was speaking there about what he called serial dramas. He made the point that psychologists are really terrible at social diffusion of their ideas. They come up with, they do a lot of research, they learn a lot about how people work, but they're not very good at taking that and putting it into a form that the public, what, what they learn into a form that the public can use and benefit from. What he did then was embark on something that he called serial dramas. So he worked with governments or uh, public institutions around the world to address certain public problems that they wanted to pay, that they wanted to get the public involved in doing. And what he did was to put together these stories, long running serial dramas. They could be either on the radio or on the television, basically soap operas. But the, they were designed to help people see different ways of behaving. So I think the topics he addressed in Mexico, it was adult uptake, excuse me, uptake of adult education. So they had education mm -hmm. programs, but not, there weren't a lot of people signing up for them. And they wanted more, too. I think in, in, in other parts of the world, it was safe sex behaviors relative to AIDS transmission, or it might have been age of marriage of daughters. There were various topics that, that he felt that he worked with organizations that they wanted to address. What he found was that these long running serial dramas, radio, people would get together and listen to them on, just like people watch soap operas in the States and Canada or other places. He found that three kinds of stories help with behavior change. Stories of the behavior that you don't want, stories of the behavior that you do want, and then stories of somebody in transition between the bad behavior and the good behavior. I think when I work with people on any kind of book that they're writing about changing behavior, I think about this idea of these three types of stories. It's stories are what help people, make people really understand in their guts what needs to be done differently. If you can somehow get across all three of these types of stories in some form of balance, I don't think it needs to be 30, 30, 30 or anything like that, but I, it needs to be some of each, then that can help to make the point come across. So the idea in the book then is about collecting story seeds, be observant in your life and collecting things that you observe that might end up being good stories and something you might want to write. Excellent. And I think you mentioned in the book, too, about really noticing what you, in addition to the story seeds, but maybe it's tied into it, noticing when you read things, what grabs you or what what is it about the stories or to really notice the style of writing. Um, do you, I think the noticing and being observant is what I'm hearing and in, in, in what I've gotten through your book, too, of there's so many experiences that we have if we stop and notice and maybe slow down and then figure out how do I want to integrate that or do I want to integrate that or what can I learn from that? Does, thoughts on that? There's there You make me think of one of the experiments that, that I was surprised how many people have told me that was the one that really connected for them, which is the idea of collecting a commonplace book which is to pay attention as you read things, when you find a quotation, when you find a particular story that, that resonates with you, to collect it together into your own personal library of, of important pieces and to actually possibly even write some little comments to yourself, to your future self about why this was so important to you right now. I think that noticing that just seeing how much, seeing what's going on in the world around you and paying attention to it 
is certainly a really important part of, it can be a really important part of writing. Great. Thank you. All right, let's shift to the share experiments. There are, what, 15 share experiments. Can you tell us about a few of them and what your most favorite one was? I've already talked about my favorite one, which is the whole question of the whole, and there are actually two experiments related to writer's workshops. One is mm. how to pick a writer's workshop. And that's where I tell people, don't go looking for brutal feedback. And if you find yourself in a situation where you come out feeling bruised and beaten after uh, the feedback experience, it's probably not going to work for you over the long haul. It's just a, a, a strong feeling that I have that most people don't know what to do with brutal feedback. There are other experiments, and there's also one that actually has, that describes how to run a writer's workshop. So if you wanted to start a writer's workshop of your own, I've got some steps in here about how you could do that. I also, one of the ones that I worked on pretty hard was helping people make up their mind. Let's assume that you write a book, okay? And you're trying to, and you're ready to go. You feel like it's in pretty good shape and you'd like to share it with the world. So the question is, do you start shopping around for a publisher? And if so, how do you do that? Or do you self-publish it? Which back probably 15 or 20 years ago, self-publishing meant you, you got things, what people referred to it as vanity press and you got things printed up and then you shipped them out of your garage. The world has changed a lot since then. There, it's not possible to publish things yourself, market them around the world. It, and one of the things that I think people think when they talk about, okay, I'm going to get a publisher to pick it up, and the publisher just takes it, and the publisher takes care of marketing it and selling it. That's not really the case anymore. If you publish a book through a publisher, they want to know that you can sell it. So you don't get away, if you're planning on doing this for a market, if you're planning on publishing a book to the world, you don't get away from having to be responsible for the marketing of the book by finding a publisher. Unless they really don't put, they don't invest in the marketing except for the really big names that they have. I have a, one experiment in the book that help, has a table that shows the benefits of going with a publisher and the benefits of self-publishing. Hmm. sort of side by side, so that you can make a decision about well, which one really works for me. It's not an easy decision, by the way. Then there's another experiment that has to do with how do you find a publisher? How do you find an agent? How do you put together? And there's, I don't have all the details about how to write a book proposal, but I have references to various people who've written books about how to do that. But I talk about how you need to put together a proposal and you need to start contacting people, and you need to be prepared for a lot of rejections. I think that I'm trying to think who it was. One one pretty famous author who talked about how she used to put her rejection letters in her freezer. <laughs> so she's starting to get this pile of rejection letters in her in her freezer. So being prepared to be right. to encounter rejections along the way is important. Or if you choose to go and do a sub-publication, there's, I've got a, an experiment about the steps that you can take to actually go through and do that. And you can do it, you can, at least the first two books that we did for Positive Sex News, we did completely ourselves. We used one of their, one of their book cover templates, bought the picture in, put the words in, et cetera. We formatted the interior of the book ourselves, and it's, it made a perfectly good book, but it doesn't look particularly polished. You probably want to get somebody else involved in internal design and book cover design if you really want to publish it with an eye on really marketing it around the world. Again, excellent advice. I've had the experience now, the book that I co-authored back in 2011, we self-published, but we did hire really wonderful person who helped with the cover and with with the formatting and of it and then luckily down the road it got picked up by a publisher so that was nice although you give up certain controls <laughs> if there's a publisher oh, yeah. but you do i want to start integrating some of the questions then we'll come back to a few other things some of them are questions about some things i think you've spoken about but i want to bring up in case the particular way the person has 
raise the question might bring some other thoughts to your mind. One is Elizabeth from Durham, and she says, oh, she lives right next door to you in Durham. She, Her question is just really wanting more about writer's block. And I, I know you've spoken some about it. She, In her situation, she talks about how her mother was such a successful published author of five novels and many stories back in the 60s and 70s. And but she's always wanted to be a writer. But that's, you know, her mother and her mother's successes have been in her head. Um, and she just is totally blocked um, because of her mother's talents and her constant fear of failing or not being as good or not coming up with an idea. And she says, even with writing prompts, such as from Storyworth, it doesn't seem to help. So she just wonders if you have any other thoughts. She says, I'm just so unconsciously afraid that I just won't succeed. If possibly one thing might be to, to, to give yourself permission to be a learner along the way. And in particular, when you sit down and you say, instead of you feeling, oh, I need to write and it needs to be as good as what my mother wrote, and my mother, at the end of her career, after she'd been writing all this time, if instead you, you thought about, you thought back to, I don't know who taught you how to drive, but mm -hmm. if you were like, when you first got in the car, you were not at all confident about how to how to steer the car, how to use the, back in those days, we had a clutch, uh, so I had to learn how to do that as well. I think I managed to stall the car in the middle of a busy intersection one time, which was really fun. But the idea is that you start small, and as this little voice that's in your head that says, oh, you're not as good as your mother, as it starts to talk, you can say, mm, yep, that's probably true, but why don't you go over, I, I used to have a friend who talked about how she would send her gremlins to the grocery store to get milk while she needed to do something. <laughs> so you do something that, that acknowledges acknowledges the fact that you've got this judgmental voice, you've got this comparison with your mother that won't completely go away and say, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to do it anyway the same way I took the, I learned how to ride a bicycle and was fell over at first a little bit. And I'm going to keep doing it and keep doing it. And so I think that maybe, I guess what's coming to my mind is self-compassion of being of being kind to the part of you that feels fear, but then not, but t somehow turning your attention to, I just want to get some words down and not worry about what they look like. And remembering that everybody writes shitty first drafts. Everybody, even your mother. Did. Um, <laughs> great, great advice. So let's see. Beverly from New Jersey says, thank you so much for your ideas and insights. Do you yourself have any practices, mental, physical, spiritual, that have helped you get to where you are with more sustained writing? I think that having some external accountability helps. So I happen to be a member of, right now I'm a member of two of my writing groups. So I need to submit something every week. I need to have something that I need to submit. And I think that having a lot of people need external accountability. They need to have somebody that they're, that they're responding to. There was one piece of advice that, that I encountered. It was a study that was done at Stanford where they, they studied professors and graduate students and they got one group to commit to writing 30 minutes a day every single day. I, maybe they took the weekends off, I don't know. But they wrote 30 minutes a day. And another group, they gave them some other advice. But what they found was the people who wrote 30 minutes a day regularly over a period of time got sometimes two to six times as much writing done as the people who didn't. So one of the things mm -hmm. might be to, to commit to yourself to having a particular time of day when you just say, I'm going to sit and I'm going to write, and I'm, maybe you have two or three writing projects that you're working on, making sure that you have some, if you're going to have short periods of writing, you need to make sure you know what you're going to do when you sit down. At the end of the session, perhaps plan what you're going to do in the next session so you don't sit down cold and have to figure out, well, what am I going to write about? So mm -hmm. those are a couple of suggestions, accountability, and one of the things the Stanford project they did was they had people have a writing partner and they would just send each other emails that would, all they would do is 
done mm-hmm. in the subject line. They wouldn't mm-hmm. actually even write an email, but they basically checked in with their writing partner to indicate that they had actually done their 30 minutes. So that might help too, as to having somebody that you actually are accountable to. Great, thank you. So Connie from Los Angeles says, and what are strategies for keeping ideas organized? She says, often ideas come at inconvenient times, like driving. How to keep those ideas that come when you're when you actually should be keeping your eyes and on the road? Uh, it sounds like it's partly that, and partly if it's like those story seeds you were talking about. I think, but yeah, part of it is how do you somehow record it or something or remember it when you're driving, but how also are there some strategies of keeping the ideas organized so that you use notebooks or do you, or I think you did comment about maybe using notes or something and recording them. Maybe that's, it's tied into what you were saying before, but it sounds like it's both. What happens when they come up at inconvenient times when you've got to pay attention to driving and are there some other strategies to just keeping them organized so they're not just floating all around? One of the things that I've done with a couple of people that I've worked with on books is to set up spreadsheets mm-hmm. in which they – and each line in the spreadsheet would might be either the title of a story, it might be a concept, a particular concept, or it might be a particular activity. And so as you start having these ideas – and I realize that when you're, if you're on the road driving, you can't stop and put something in a spreadsheet. But it might be that you, you say, hey, Siri, take a note, mm-hmm. and which – you could probably do without being, it being dangerous when you're driving. And so you speak and capture it that way. And then later, when you get to a place where you have a chance to move it over, you could put it in your spreadsheet. I actually found this, the spreadsheet idea. I worked with one particular person who had, a, who put together a wonderful book. It's called The Effort Myth by Sherry Fisher. And I helped her edit it. And what we found was we went through and identified all of the stories, all of the concepts, and all of the activities, made a big spreadsheet. And then we, at the end, we rearranged things, put them together in in different units. So that actually gave us the ability to move things into the places where, at that point, it seemed like they fit. Hmm. Great. What was the name of that book? um... It's The Effort Myth by Sherry Fisher, and it's a book that was written for people dealing with ch- children having learning difficulties. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll just put a little pitch in for it. Her thought, and she's been working with kids like this for 40 years, but she said too often people just tell them, work harder. And mm-hmm. she said, working harder doesn't solve the problem. They need to work differently, and you need to help them learn how to work differently. So just telling mm-hmm. somebody, work harder if you're not succeeding doesn't necessarily work. Good point. She sort of ties into this a question from Genevieve, who says that, that she has dyslexia and her learning ability and level reading and writing is not good. And as she's been evaluated by peers, and she says she refuses to apply to any job that I need to write. However, she took the courage to currently do a master's degree, and she struggled with the thesis, but did get it done. Can you talk a little bit more? I guess it could be the inner dialogue we have, but what about if people do recognize that they have dyslexia or word retrieval or all kinds of processing issues? Any specific suggestions for them, or are they still some of the experiments that you mentioned in the book? Well, it's not really my area of expertise, yeah. but I will tell you that there's various different modalities for writing. It doesn't have to be fingers on a keyboard. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, you can, if you, I worked with somebody once who was having a whole lot of trouble getting, she said she was really good at editing once she had a first draft, but the first draft was really hard for her. What I suggest, I asked her, what, if you were to try and explain this to a friend, could you do that? And she mm-hmm. said, oh yeah, no problem at all. What I suggested she do was use, back in those days, it was drag and speak, but nowadays there's so many other different things you can do to speak out loud and have your writing transcribed. And that can give you a first draft. So if you find Mm -hmm. that you can't write, like with your fingers, you can't write a first draft, 
try dictating it or try to tell the stories out loud. I collected stories from six of my cousins about growing up in southern Idaho. And we did this by having conversations on Zoom that I had transcribed and then I edited them down and it's become a really it's become a really a little resource to have for the family about what life was like in Idaho back in the sixties back in the sixties. What a great idea, yeah, to do it that way. Beverly from New Jersey just wanted to thank you for, oh, no, I already read that one, but Barbara from New Jersey said that she really loved your example of breaking writing projects into smaller parts. She actually wrote her thesis that way in 15-minute segments, and it made what seemed like an overwhelming project into a manageable task, and she thought it was a great suggestion. Um, Avanish has a number of questions. Let me pull them together and I'll just ask all of, I'm going to just throw them out there and you can respond as you think it would be helpful. He wonders if all of this applies to nonfiction books. He's thinking about writing a nonfiction book about global project management. He also wonders how do you get an agent and does putting a timeline on writing books help? Deadlines maybe for each chapter or the whole book? So those were his questions. Maybe you can respond to any or all of those parts. My, I, most of my experience is with people writing nonfiction, and I am right, quite humble about the question of writing fiction, that I know less about how to help do character development and plot development, et cetera, than I do about how to, how to help people get ideas clearly across to, an, to a particular audience. So I would say, yes, all of it, that it works for nonfiction. Finding an agent, that's a long topic. I've got some ideas in the book, but I can't say that I feel like I'm a particularly an, uh, an expert on it. Uh, you could certainly start with books that are like the book that you want and look and see if there could possibly people acknowledge their agents in it. And then there are various different kinds of web searches you can do to find agents for your ideas. And then Whatever helps you manage your time, that's whatever makes you – the problem with writing often is that it's something that if you – if you remember the Eisenhower Matrix where you have things that are urgent and things that are important, and the things that are urgent and important tend to get done, the problem is that the things that are not urgent or that are urgent but not important tend to take precedence over the things that are important but not urgent. So part of what you have to do is for managing your time is you have to make sure that you're putting enough attention to the important things that are not urgent. And can I throw in a little place to plug for a place that people can get more ideas that they like to look? Absolutely. Please do. Yep. Okay. So I am, I have a, a website called sit, write, share. Dot, dot com. And on that website, I have a blog where I publish an article probably maybe once a month, maybe twice a month. But many of these articles are additional ideas for how to go about writing. So I'm thinking of it as being a place where I'm depositing future experiments that I might incorporate into a, a second edition of my book. So as ideas, so for example, the whole idea about stringing stories, stringing stories together on a necklace, the beads on a necklace is one that I wrote in a blog post not too long ago. I also have an Instagram channel, Instagram, sit, write, share, and I try to put something up three times a week. On Mondays, I put one of the morals for my book. The morals are the summaries for each of the experiments. On Saturdays, I put up one of the questions that I think can help people figure out where they need to put attention. So it'll be a question. It actually comes from a workbook that I put together for Sit Right Share that has 28 questions in it where you ask yourself things like, I know how to write for different kinds of publications. And if you look at that and you say, yeah, I know that, then you write down, you, you write down in the work, workbook, which give yourself credit for what you already know. And if not, it points you to a couple of experiments in the books that, book that you could try. You can get the workbook by just going to my website and signing up at the, at the very bottom. There's a place that you can sign up for the workbook, and then you'll get the blog posts as they come out. Oh, great. 
Terrific. Again, why don't you just say again your website, and I'll have to say it again right at the end, but then we'll go back to a few of the okay. other questions. Yep. So your website is? It's, it's rightshare.com. All run together. Great. Thank you. All right. Just a few more questions here. Helen says from New York says, to what extent do you think it's important to build your author's platform before publishing? If you want to attract a publisher, you will have to build an author's platform. And what an author's platform means is people that you can reach with your, with, they're on your mailing list, they are subscribers, you know, they are followers on Instagram, they are followers on Facebook, they're people that you could reach with your materials when you, when you are putting out the word about your book. And the numbers that people receive when they talk to publishers about how big does my platform have to be, sometimes they used to say 10,000 people in your platform. Um, now the numbers tend to get bigger depending on how eager they are to publish your book. It's be aware that this idea of building a platform, of getting a following, of, of and there are various ways to do it. I have a few ideas in the book, but I think that there I don't have – really a lot of ideas in the book, but I would like to just acknowledge again that if when it's time for your book to be published, you are the one that is responsible for selling it. Absolutely true. I can say that from experience also. <laughs> it's really true. So uh, Christiania, I'm sorry about my pronunciation here, she basically says when you've got all sorts of ideas in your head, all sorts of stories in your head, how do you decide what story to start with? First thing I would do is I would I would have something that is the equivalent of an idea jar. Hmm. Okay, so when my daughter was working on her dissertation, she had a lot of ideas that her dissertation advisor would say, yep, that's important, but it doesn't belong in your dissertation. And what she started doing was writing them down on a piece of paper and then putting them in are. In other words, all of those ideas that you have, collect them. And then you could pick one at random. You could pick the one that is most recent. You could pick the one that is most salient to you. How you pick, how you pick the bead to develop, really, there's all kinds of different ways you could try for that. The point, though, is to keep, is to take advantage of that time when you feel like your head is full of ideas. To take advantage of that because there'll be other times when you don't, when you feel like, I can't think of anything to write about. And that's when you can reach into your idea jar, pull something out, and then get started writing it up. Oh, another wonderful suggestion. Thank you. And the final question, which Meg from Cambridge admits might or might not be totally pertinent, but I think since you mentioned it, I want to bring it up. And she just says, first of all, thank you, Catherine, for this excellent advice. Wish I had it earlier in my life. I feel the same way, I must say. <laughs> and her question um, is about your mention of, of the uh, GPT chat. Um, she says, how would you advise students to use it to help their writing as opposed to either lose any ability to write or to be intellectually dishonest? She said she's personally worried about the impact of AI more generally on our humanity. So that was basically her question, and she apologized because she was writing this as she was listening to you. But but you did mention about the, the GPT yes. chat, so it seems like an important thing to maybe comment on if you could. I guess I would think about it from the point of view of it's there, it's coming, mm -hmm. it's part of our it's part of our world now. I I don't really have a good answer for that other than to say it could be – I actually heard somebody – have one of the people in one of my groups write a piece recently where she was talking about working with her students using chat GPT. And I think what you could do is to use it as a – almost like a dialogue partner. So you use chat GPT. It can be used for a number of different purposes. It could be used – to help you come up with your ideas. It could be used to help you polish the, I think that it can do something for you, but I think that the important thing is for you, when you finish a piece of work that you've done in partnership with ChatGPT, to be able to read through the whole thing and say, yes, these are my words. 
and you mm-hmm. could say, okay, sometimes words come in conference with somebody else. I have found creativity often happens in the space between people. So mm-hmm. it's like you're working with somebody else on something. Maybe you're at a whiteboard and you're working on a particular, and this is back from my software engineering days, you're working on a particular design. When you finish the work, you don't really know who actually created it because it came out of that working space between you. I suspect there'll be a little bit of that with chat GPT. Mm-hmm. But my general thought is that at the end of it, you need to do a gut check and say, is this something that I produced in, in partnership with a partner here? Or is it something that I'm putting my name on that I don't feel like I own? I, which is to say, I don't have a really, I don't have a perfect answer here. I'm still experimenting and learning from it. I did have one person write a speech for Toastmasters that was very funny that he had chat GPT do for him. Um, so I guess I think we, we all to be open to learning. Yeah. 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 No, I think that was a good response to it. Thank you. I, I like that idea of a dialogue partner too. And, thinking about, is it my words or someone else's words? Or And I do remember, tied in with that, there was a part in your book where you talked about maybe using quotes, but then thinking about, do you want to use the quotes or are there ways you can put it in your own words? Or I'm not doing justice to what you said in the book, but something like that. But that idea of differentiating your voice from the other voices that you hear or read about or or want to share. Yes. Elizabeth just says thank you so much that she's so happy to be getting your book and also interested in reading your books about positive psychology. And I hope other people will do that too. This has just been such a rich conversation, Catherine. So again, I know you said it before, but let people know your website and how to get that workbook and how to get your blogs. And then I'm going to ask for a final takeaway for our listeners. The, my my website is sitrightshare.com. The blog is sitrightshare.com slash blog. So that should be easy to remember. And I Instagram at sitrightshare. So if you can remember the book title, you can probably remember my website and my, and my, uh, in, in, the workbook is actually mostly useful if you have the book. So it's not mm-hmm. something that's really particularly useful by itself. I put it together because one of the people who beta read, beta tested my book said that there were so many experiments there that he wasn't sure he could figure out which one he wanted to try first. And so I put this together to help people navigate towards, you know, what they might want to work on now. And let's see, what other question you had? So the final one was just as we come to the end of this, what final thought takeaway would you like to leave with the listeners today after the, your wonderful presentation? I would just say, if you hear your, if you hear the voice in your head saying, I'm not a writer, just think to yourself, anybody is a writer. I'm already a writer. And I, and think about who you want to, to share with. And that person that you want to share with might be yourself in the future. So I often think about writing things for my future self, and I wish that my earlier self had written more for my future, for myself Mm -hmm. right now. My husband, for example, has written down what he, what what we, he called secrets. This is when my daughter was a very young child. She came home from preschool and she said, Daddy, tell me a secret. And so he started telling her stories about his family and his growing up and his grandparents and everything. And he's collected these stories, these secrets, as something that he can pass down to her. Oh, I'm actually going telling a whole new story here. But for the final word, I would just say, don't believe the words, I'm not a writer. You are a writer. Thanks. But I also love hearing about this idea of writing down the secrets and then thinking about what you said before, that that can be part of the memoir, stringing them together, but also just little chapters of your life. And I think it's so important to share that with next generations because we we're the we will be the ancestors basically so i love that example from your husband too thank you so much Catherine. you have so much wonderful suggestions to offer and i know i people have really found this inspiring as i have too and i'm planning to do some memoir writing and so i'm going to be using some of your experiments so thank you thank
thank you everybody for being here and stay well and safe. Take care. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.